Good day, everybody, and welcome to Lesson 2 in the Ben and Boz Narrated PowerPoint Series. Today, we're going to be talking about the balance sheet. I'm Boz. I'm Ben. How you doing today, man? It's a great day today. Beautiful it, here. It is. It's sunny outside, and we're in, sitting inside recording videos, but at least we got a, got a nice sunny sky to look, in, look out at. You know, the first video, we just kind of did an intro, and now we get into our first financial statement we get into the balance sheet and i think you're going to start us off with an example right you know i'd actually rather be in here talking about the balance sheet <laughs> i do love the outdoors accountants with dorky, so. <laughs> but anyway um on this slide you see that we have nike's balance sheet as of may 31st 2018 and i want you to know that everything on this balance sheet is in millions so you can see up here in the top left it says dollars and millions and so just a quick look at that shows you that they had cash of $4.2 billion um, available to them as of May 31st, 2018. More than I got. I'm not going to ask you how much you have. <laughs> less than <laughs> $4.2 We'll just say it's less than, it's not quite yes, $4.2 not, not quite. All right. So first thing that I do want to look at here, though, is how much debt does Nike have? And so if you take a second, look around. If you really want to pause the video, you can. But you see they have a current portion of long-term debt of $6 million and long-term debt down here of $3.5 billion. So what do you think about that, Buzz? It's a lot. You know, they barely have enough cash to cover that. So that at first glance, that would make me nervous. But, Boz knows, we're going to take a second glance, actually, and compare that debt amount to the total value of Nike's assets. So if you look through this balance sheet a little bit, you'll see right above current liabilities, it says total assets in all caps, and that puts us at $22.5 billion in total assets. Now I'm feeling better. You feel so a little bit better. We have a lot more assets to cover our debt. Yep, feeling good. Good, good. So um, that's just a quick example of something you can get from the balance sheet. One more example is looking at Nike's market cap relative to how much the shareholders contributed. So just a refresher, in our first video, we briefly touched on market cap. If I took all the shares outstanding of Nike, multiplied by the price per share of Nike, it came out to about 124 billion. And this was a few days ago, probably a little different now when you're looking at it, but at the time it was 124 billion. Yep. In the last video, we talked about Apple being the most valuable company in the world. Their market cap was nearly a trillion dollars. So just another example of, of where Nike's at. Absolutely. And so what you can see then, if you look on the balance sheet in the shareholders equity section, that capital in excess of stated value. Now that sounds kind of complicated, but really what that is, is what are the amounts that shareholders have contributed to the business? And so shareholders have contributed $6.4 billion dollars and now their shares are worth $124 billion. So did you get in early on Nike, Buzz? You know, I wish I would have. That's a 20 times return right there. So for every dollar you would have contributed, you got uh, would get at least 20 in return. And there's probably even some in excess of that. But no, I did not get in that early. I did not, you unfortunately, did not either. either so, but, but I wasn't alive. You weren't alive <laughs> when Nike fair. was born. I was yeah. born in 72. I don't know when they were founded. But anyway. Anyway. Moving on. So our goal for today, we have two main things we want to accomplish. Number one, we want you to walk away from this video having a better understanding of what an asset is, what a liability is, and what, what does equity even mean. And then number two, we want to understand how big companies like Nike, for example, track all the amounts that go into assets, liability, and equity using something called transaction analysis and journal entries. So with that, Let's start with assets. First things first, this is just a snapshot of the balance sheet that you saw earlier, focused in on just the asset section. You can see some examples, cash, short-term investments, accounts receivable, that's when they make a sale to maybe like a department store, and they're waiting for that department store to pay them for that, that's accounts receivable. So just a couple examples there. But we're gonna define an asset in this video as any economic resource that will provide future benefits to a business. I think some of those, so maybe when we look at that, I mean, certainly cash, we can understand that. We can understand inventories. Those are the shoes and the shirts they haven't sold. So what wouldn't be an asset then? I guess, what's an example of something that wouldn't be an asset? Are you yeah. referring to like liabilities or, oh, I get what you're saying. Something a company I'm has that's not yep. an asset. So once you get into the point where you're doing your interviews and you're going to talk to a lot of companies and almost without fail, they're going to say the greatest resource 
is their people. Yeah, yeah. But it's hard to come up with a dollar value for a person. Yeah. And so that's why we say economic resource, something that that's has it. what's called a historical cost, where you've paid an amount. People would be a human resource. So we don't it's record a human, human resource. resources no. as assets, economic resources. We do not. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, a couple of examples here. Cash. When we think about cash, it's an immediate benefit for the business. So it's an asset um, because it will provide that benefit. You can either reinvest that, you can distribute it in the form of a dividend, really whatever you want to do with it. Cash is king, right, Buzz? I, I think so. You don't have cash, it's tough to run a business. <laughs> Another example, property, plant, and equipment. That's an asset because you can use that property or that plant or the equipment, I guess, to manufacture your products, which you can then, if you're Nike, sell to. Um, these are convenience stores. Yeah, when I hear plant, um, that's not like plants. You know, we're sitting in your house. Do you have, you have any plants? I don't know if you have any plants. We have but some the, fake flowers. We have over some there. fake flowers. But like a manufacturing plant. When we think of plant, that's that's what we're saying right there. And then one last thing that I want to point out in this balance sheet is that we have two categories usually: current assets and non-current assets. So you see here we have a subtotal. Total current assets is fifteen billion one hundred and thirty-four million. That's just adding up everything above it. And then you add in property and equipment, identifiable and tangible assets, goodwill, deferred income taxes, and then that all together plus the 15 gives you the 22.5. So now current assets, what makes an asset current? How do we define current in the accounting world? Yep. So anything that you're gonna use within a year. Within a year, yeah. Or convert to cash within a year. Yep, yep, so one year. And then non-current is anything greater than that. But add those two together and that's how you get total assets. Nice. All right. You good on an asset, I'm, Buzz? I'm good. I don't have anything else to say on that one. I think you probably already knew all that stuff. I, well, I appreciate it, so thank you. <laughs> all right, moving on. Next, we have liabilities. And so, again, you see we have current liabilities. This is just part of Nike's balance sheet. Um, they have current portion of long-term debt, notes payable. That's where if they like sign an agreement and to borrow a set amount of money, Accounts payable, that's an example where um, Nike borrowed, I got, I'm sorry, they purchased some materials perhaps from a manufacturer. Their suppliers, that's what yep. they owe their suppliers. And yep. they haven't paid it yet. So um, a liability we're going to define is any future obligation of economic resources based on past events. So simplistically, we here. usually think of like, cash we owe to people right but that's mm -hmm. it's that's not an all-encompassing one that's probably the most common is yep. someone's given us something and we got to pay them back right a supplier sold nike some raw materials to make into their shirts they got to pay them back someone's done some work for us we got to pay them back those are the most common probably exactly so if you're looking for a simpler way to define it or explain mm -hmm. it to your friends probably i imagine you'll be talking a lot about this with your friends <laughs> your <laughs> totally. video so totally. um, you can go ahead and give them the simple definition so yep. um, there are some unique cases where it's not just money you got to pay people for stuff they've given you. So that's why that's definition we've given is a little bit more proper because it'll, it, it'll encompass some some other unique. Uh, just accounts. wait for lesson four. <laughs> that's right. It's totally. coming in lesson four. Totally. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, all right. So a couple of examples. We talked about accounts payable when that company receives the goods from any sort of supplier promises to pay later um, and long term debt. When a company borrows money, usually that's going to come from a bank. It could be, if they issue debt, it could be coming from investors, potentially, um, and promises to repay it in the future. Exactly. So mm -hmm. um, you'll notice as you go through this and other companies, there's a lot of different liabilities. These videos aren't going to take you through all the assets, all the liabilities, but we hope to give you some sort of conceptual framework to help you understand what they are. So one last thing, just like assets are broken into current and non-current, liabilities are also broken into current and non-current. And a great example of this is how you see long-term debt. We have the six million of it is classified as current, meaning it's due within one year, whereas the long-term debt is gonna be due greater than a year from now. Yeah, so they, 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 took, out a lo they took out some sort of long-term loan and now it's coming due at various points in time and there's a piece of that long-term loan that is now coming due within one year so that's the part that uh, is now the current part awesome anything else on this one boss no, i'm good all right let's move on to equity so on this equity section our definition technically it's a stockholder's claim to the assets after all liabilities have been satisfied so a simpler way of thinking about that 
assets is everything that a company has that's gonna help them make money or the money itself. Liabilities is everything that they owe other people. So if you take what they have, subtract out what they owe other people, anything that's left, that's how you get equity. And mm -hmm. that goes to the shareholders then. They're said to be at the end of that yep. line. Yeah, I just, in theory, you could take all the assets, pay off the liabilities, and the shareholders could just take whatever's left and then uh, just go off and do something else. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you see on the screen, equity, we break it apart into two parts, common stock and retained earnings usually. So anything that's contributed by the owners, that's what we call common stock. And sometimes it's called additional or contributed capital or paid in capital. There's a lot of very different words for it. Um, they all pretty much mean the same thing though. Um, in Nike's equity section here, it's called capital in excess of stated value. Um, as you see, it's somewhat similar, but not quite the same. That's just something yeah, that you'll have to get used to when you study accounting is uh, the, the, the same thing can be described many different ways. So when you, you just got to kind of get used to what that is. That might be when you talked about the language of accounting mm, yes. in the last yeah. video. Yeah, language well, of business. Well, totally. I think in, you know, in, in English, right? Yeah. When I see you, I can say hello. I can say hi. I can say hey, right? It's all saying the same thing. I'm just greeting you. Same thing That's with accounting. That's a good accounting. example. Thanks, man. Thank you. I'm going to use that in my class. <laughs> <laughs> like it. All right. And then the second category, retained earnings, is really just money that's been earned by the business that hasn't been distributed back to the owners through the form of dividends. So it's not like they have all this money just sitting in a bank account called retained earnings, but it's what they have made that they haven't given out in the form of dividends. Mm -hmm. Totally. All right. Moving on. Well, sorry, one last note before we go on. It gets much more complicated in this category. Yeah. But, yep. um, Boz, I think I want to give you a little test. All right, we'll try. All right. So here we have a little knowledge check. Feel free to pause the video at this point if you want and just see how well you do. But your goal is to group the accounts that we have on the left into the various categories on the right. So Bob, I'm not giving you any time to look at it, and there's no solutions built I, into these. We slides. don't have the solutions. You haven't so, told me the answers, so this is. How would you classify cash? I'm going current asset. Correct. How yep. are accounts payable? I'm going current liability. I gotta. I owe someone money. I gotta pay it within a year. There you go. How about retained earnings? It's one of the two equity accounts. Excellent. How about debt? I'm going to assume it's a long-term debt. I'm going to pay it off in longer than a year, so I'm going to put it in non-current liabilities. I want you to succeed today, so I'm going to agree with you, but you nailed it right on the head when you said you need to know if it was long-term be or short-term mm -hmm. before you decide if it was current liabilities or non-current. Was that kind of a trick question? A little bit. A little bit. All right. <laughs> so. uh, but it was a talking point. That's order. right. So That's right. how about common stock? That's the second big equity component. There you go. So retained earnings and uh, common stock go into equity. How about equipment? Uh, it's a non-current asset because you don't expect to use it up within a year. Absolutely. Inventory? It's a current asset because you want to sell it within a year. You don't want long-term inventory. You don't, you don't, Nike doesn't like make a shirt and hope to sell it eight years from now. They're going to want to sell it this year. Current asset. You don't like throwback shoes? <laughs> um, well, but it's throwback. They make them new. And, oh, yeah, there yeah. you go. You That's see the, the throwback okay. shoes. It's not, they haven't hung on to them for 40 years. So how about land? Where does that fit? Land would be non-current because you expect to hold it for more than one year. There you go. Mm -hmm. Well done, Boz. Hundred percent. I I appreciate that. Your accounting professor got a hundred percent. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right. So the big question here is why should you care? Well, what we have is investors and creditors. Both of them are going to look at the balance sheet. Could also include potential investors, but based on what they see on the balance sheet they're gonna decide whether or not they want to invest in that company. So as an example, before making a loan, a creditor might look at the assets and say, just like we did with Nike right away, and say, hey, these assets aren't enough to cover the current debt that they have. I don't wanna give them any more debt because if they don't pay, there won't be any assets for me to take. Um, likewise, investors, when they're looking at buying a stock, they might look at what are the current assets relative to current liabilities because if you have a lot of current liabilities, things you have to pay within one year, you hope you have a lot of current assets where you're going to get a lot of cash within one year to meet those obligations. Yeah, and for the most part, we're going to go through a lot of this analysis, the why do you care. That's, that's mainly lesson 12 We're going to, when we tie it all together because you're usually going to be pulling in income statement accounts, balance sheet accounts, cash flow accounts all together when doing this analysis. So this is just a couple simple balance sheet ones. All right. 
Well, let's keep rolling. Our next section then, that kind of covered goal one for us, goal number two. How do companies keep track of all this, especially considering they could have billions of dollars, multiple countries, anywhere in the world, a lot of different things though. And so what companies use is called double entry accounting. So each transaction that a company has, and a transaction is anytime economic value is exchanged between two parties. And so say Boz and I were to enter into agreement where I say, Boz, you mow my lawn, I'll pay you a hundred bucks in August. And so Boz hasn't mowed my lawn yet, and I haven't paid him the money yet, that's not a transaction because no economic resources have actually exchanged hands. Now, if I said, Boz, you mow my lawn, here's $100, um, I've given him $100, so that is a transaction, and I would need to record that. Exactly. You know, double entry accounting, little history, developed back in 1494 by, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, Lu Luca Pacchioli? Just say it with some confidence, and that'll be right. Lucia Pacioli, <laughs> oh, 1494. Nice. You can't see him, but he did the hand gestures too, so <laughs> it's pretty good. Right. But let's talk about how double entry accounting works. What that means is that every time you have a transaction, you're going to make an entry into at least two accounts. It could be more, it could be three, four, five, a hundred, a thousand, whatever it is, but it has to be at least two. It most commonly probably is just two. Yep, but, yeah, absolutely. And one account is going to have to be debited, and the other account is going to have to be credited. Now, debit and credit, don't think of this as like your bank account. It says you have a debit or a credit or your credit card statement or anything like that. This is completely separate. It's not necessarily that a debit is a good thing or a credit is a good thing. They're just ways of saying it has a debit balance or a credit balance. Just the language of it. Yep, the way of maintaining balances more on the language of accounting. It is? But Boy. every entry that you make has to have a debit that is equally offset by credits, so it keeps everything in balance, kind of like a balance sheet. Oh, it's gonna be in balance. Ties in. You yeah. see what I did there? I, I did, that's yeah. awesome. So yeah, debits <laughs> also always have to equal credits, no exceptions. Debits are always on the left, credits are always on the right. Always. No exceptions. No exceptions. All right, so let's look at this balance sheet equation then. We talked about this in video one where we said assets equals liabilities plus equity. But now we're gonna add in what we had on that last slide. It's called a T account, where you see right here, this is a T account, how those two lines make a T. Going back to accountants not being creative with their naming conventions. I, I see a T, I see it. Well, assets are said to have a debit balance. So anytime you would increase an asset, you would debit the asset. And anytime you decrease an asset, you would credit it. Like you might guess, on the opposite side of the equation here, we have liabilities with a credit balance. They increase on the credit side. So if I take out more debt, I'm going to increase the credit for liabilities um, and increase the cash on the asset side. And then we have equity, which follows the exact same pattern. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Boss? I, not really. The, we're going to come back to that equation time after time. You're probably going to get sick of looking at this, but it is very helpful just to see how it all remains in balance. So examples to help drive this point home. Um, owners contribute $1,000 of cash to start a business. So in this case, cash, like we have, is gonna go up by 1,000. Liabilities, nobody owes anyone anything necessarily. Owners are just contributing it. So if it's an owner, it's gonna be common stock, and we're gonna credit that for 1,000. I think the big takeaway there is that Assets have increased by a thousand, and the combination of liabilities and equity has also increased by a thousand. Yeah, perfect. And you can see that right here in these T accounts. The left side under assets, if we, you can see the mouse here, assets, we have the left side cash is a thousand, liabilities and equity, one thousand. Mm -hmm. Example two a business borrows $500 from the bank. So in this case, we borrowed money, so cash is gonna go up. We're gonna have an extra 500 bucks in cash. And then our liabilities, because we borrowed it from the bank, we have to pay them back later, are also gonna increase by $500. And so in this one, we just added the 500 under the cash tab. So now our total cash is 1,500. We'd add those two together. We have debt under the liabilities category of 500 because we owe the bank 500. And then we have common stock still for a thousand from our first transaction. So on the left, we have 1500. On the right, we have 1500. Everything's in balance and mm -hmm. it's a sunny day. It is a sunny day. That's good. <laughs> yeah. 
Finally, a third example here, because we don't always have to have something on just one item on the left side of the equation, one item on the liabilities or equity side. In example three, you buy equipment for $700 using cash. And now you can see we have another asset account, equipment, that we're gonna debit for 700 because we have more of the equipment, but we paid for it with cash, so we lost some cash, it's gonna decrease, so we have to credit our cash for 700. And in this case, the 700 increase on an asset and the 700 decrease on an asset effectively nets out to zero, and we're still left with 1,500 in total assets and 1,500 in liabilities and equity. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at that, this is the first time thinking of journal entries. This should be tough right now, right? This, this, this should be a little unclear, but we're gonna go through example after example after example, and hopefully it eventually does become clear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so you might be saying to yourself, like Boss alluded to, what is going on? How am I ever gonna figure out how all things happen? All these things happen. And the way we're gonna do that is with transaction analysis. So when given a business transaction, Boz and I came up with a nice little five-step process here to help us figure out basically what to do with it. Um, and touching on that first bullet point here a little bit, instead of using T accounts, most companies use journal entries where they're gonna have a software system that you just enter in a couple things. It's called a journal entry and that updates all the T accounts and the entire system for you on the financial statements. Okay, like someone might have a journal to talk about what happened in their day. A company has a journal to talk about business transactions that happen. That's a good analogy. Well, thanks, man. Thank you. You're on fire. In fuego. <laughs> More Spanish. Muy en fuego. <laughs> Muy en fuego. All right, so this five-step process. First thing you should do when you see a business transaction is identify the accounts that are impacted and the end categories there in parentheses, that means identify if it's an asset or a liability or an equity account, because that will help you decide if you need to debit or credit or which way it increases. Mm -hmm. Remember, there's always gonna be at least two accounts. So number two, determine whether each account is increasing or decreasing. So now that we know what our accounts and the categories are, we can say, oh, cash is increasing, that's an asset, assets increase on the debit side, so I know I have to debit cash. Step three, for each account, determine if it increases on the debit or credit side. I guess I jumped the gun a little bit, explaining okay. number two. But All right, man. Then you decide debit or credit. Mm -hmm. Step three is an easy one. <laughs> and then number four, just record your journal entry. We'll show you how to do that in the next example. And then last one, number five, double check if debits equal credits, you're on the right track. And if they don't, and something's probably off a little bit, you wanna give it another look. Exactly. That sounds simple, but it, you can make a mistake and they might not equal and the, the, your financial statements are going to be messed up at that point. Yeah, happens all the time. Yeah. All right. So example one of transaction analysis, we have a company that is going to pay a vendor $300 in cash and then they're going to get some inventory as a result that that company can go on and sell, hopefully. So um, step one, identify the accounts and categories impacted and we always have to have at least two. Boz, do you want to tell me the answers for this example or do you want me to do it? Well, you know, this one I could just say, you know, cash and inventory are the two accounts and that might sound obvious based on this transaction. It says a company purchases 300 bucks of inventory using cash. So cash and inventory are the two accounts. It's not always that easy though. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not always in the description that you can pull out the account names. It just so happens these are a couple common accounts and uh, cash and inventory are both assets in this situation. Learning to walk before we can run. That's right, <laughs> start, start with an easy one. All right, so step two, we know inventory and cash, they're both assets, and then determine whether each account is increasing or decreasing. So inventory in this case, what's it gonna do, boss? Inventory is going up and your cash is going down. There we go, look at that. Inventory increasing, cash decreasing. Mm -hmm. In fuego. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, for each account, determine if it increases on the debit or credit side. So inventory and cash are both assets. So how do assets increase? Debit, like you might guess, and how they decrease is a credit. So what we're gonna wanna do is debit our inventory and credit the cash. And then number four, record the journal entry. Some people are a little nitpicky on their journal entries, so we're gonna kinda talk through what that looks like right now, but really you should kinda just figure out what um, what's expected of you and go that way. Mm -hmm. So in an inventory, we have a debit, or in this journal entry, we have a debit to inventory for 300, 
and then we're going to have a credit to cash of 300, which is exactly what we determined in steps one through three. But what we're showing here is the debit is on the left side, and then the credit is indented a little bit, on, and then on the right. And then the same thing with the dollar amounts, where the debit amount is on the left, and the credit amount is on the right. Yeah, when you said they're picky, sometimes, whether it's a professor or a company, might change that format a little bit. But uh, yeah, debit's first, credit second is uh, one of the most important things to know. And I think this kind of brings back to the point, um, a debit is not necessarily good and a credit is, is not like bad. I mean, it's not bad that we spent cash here, right? We had to buy inventory, that's part of our business. We gotta go out and, and get some inventory in order to uh, in order to have something to sell. So this isn't a, a bad thing that's happened here, it's just something that happened and we have to record it. You could even argue it's a good thing because hopefully thing, yeah. you'll sell that inventory for totally. a greater price than you paid. Totally. And then the last one, double check that debits equal credits. And as you can see, 300 equals 300. So we're good to go. So now there's another example in here. We're going to go a little bit more quickly through this one, just in the interest of time. But feel free to slow it down, pause the video, do anything you need to help you learn it. So transaction number two, company purchased $200 of supplies and agreed to pay the vendor in 30 days. Um, just a term vendor means anyone that our company is purchasing supplies from. <clears throat> First thing, identify the accounts and categories impacted. So in this case, supplies is going to be an asset. That's something good. We can use that in our business. And then we're going to pay later. So it's going to be accounts payable, which is a liability. This is a good example, like in that <laughs> the transaction as you listed it, it doesn't say accounts payable anywhere. We just kind of have to know that if we've purchased from someone and we're gonna pay them later, that is an account payable. That's just a, kind of the language of accounting here. Yep, absolutely. So number two, determine whether each account is increasing or decreasing. Well, we got some more supplies, so supplies is gonna be increasing. And then we increased our accounts payable because we pay more money. So in this case, we have both supplies and accounts payable are increasing, which is the point of this is to show you that it doesn't always have to be something's going up and any other account is going down. They can both go up. Yeah, if you think of that, that framework, assets have to equal liabilities plus equity. You couldn't have assets go up and liabilities go down. That's That can't happen. So if assets are going up, liabilities and equity have to be going up as well. All right, so number three, determine if each account increases on the debit or credit side. Well, we already said supplies is an asset and assets increase on the debit side. Accounts payable is a liability, and liabilities increase on the credit side. So we have a debit to supplies and a credit to accounts payable. And so now that we know everything that we have here, we just have to record our journal entry like we talked about before. Supplies for 200 on the left, accounts payable for 200, a little bit lower and on the right. And then lastly, double check, and we see that debits do equal our total credits. We made our second journal entry. Very Look exciting. At that. Let's do. Do we have one more, or is that? Uh, that's it. That's only two for today. That's I'm right. Sorry, that's boss. A, I was just. I just wanted more, right? So, I appreciate that. That's, that's right. good. Okay. All right. So, last thing. Let's. Uh, how do we keep track then? If we just kind of summarize the second part of the PowerPoint here, using accounting software as a business, we're going to record the journal entries. So each individual will record the journal entries, or the accountant will record them. Then the software is going to take that journal entry and put it into what's technically called a ledger, but you saw it today as a T account. And that's just gonna be anything that keeps track of all the transactions that impacted that one specific account. And then finally, again, that software probably is gonna take all the totals in the ledger or your T account and convert it to a balance sheet where we'll hopefully look at it and analyze it and see how we did. And I think an important takeaway here is yes there is software that'll take care of a lot of things behind the scenes for you but that raw input is still done you know by humans and uh, as an example you're not gonna mess up cash but if you put a you know if you were supposed to uh, credit account payable and instead you credit an account receivable that would really mess something up so even though there is accounting software the, the key inputs still are done by humans so you have to understand how this works Absolutely, and that's what means what we want you to do is focus on that key input, which is the journal entry. All right, so let's wrap up here with some key takeaways. Hopefully by now you better understand what an asset is, what a liability is, and what equity is, and that you can take any accounts that are given to you and classify them into one of those three categories, just like Boz can, 100% on that. I like it, yeah. And then number two, 
Um, we hope you have a pretty good intro as far as how to record transactions using journal entries. We went through five different journal entries in this video. There are literally thousands and millions and billions of different journal billions. entries. There are so. billions of journal entries that you could have. So it's going to mm -hmm. take a lot of practice, but um, hopefully you understand that general framework of what to do and then um, can crush it going forward. That's right. That was good. I think we gave them a good framework, and uh, hopefully they'll tune back in next time to learn about the income statement. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you next time.